okay I had drawn this diagram to save the time and this one is recording like if there is a person that comes to the emergency with any road traffic accident or any traumatic brain injury then this flowchart will come into play like if there is any head injury <clears throat> just imagine there is a head injury this is the cranial cavity the cranium and this part is the brain so if there is any injury to this part so that will lead to bleeding within the cranium so bleeding can be either the extradural or the subdural hemorrhage or the subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage so we won't go into detail of what kind of these just imagine there is hemorrhage within this cranial cavity if there occurs any sort of the hemorrhage within this cranial cavity suppose there is this <coughs> bleeding okay this hemorrhage this collection of the fluid is there then what will happen to the brain this brain it will get compressed right it will get compressed and this is imagine this is the midline so when it gets compressed there is compression because of the collection of the fluid then this medial part of the temporal lobe this is called as ankur medial temporal lobe is called as ankur see there are two cerebral hemisphere this medial part this is the ankur so lower one is cerebellum if, if we do the cut section say this part here it is coming the cerebellum and this is the cerebral hemisphere so that is called as tentorium cerebelli that separates cerebral hemisphere both of the cerebral hemisphere from the cerebellum that is tentorium cerebelli and the medial part of the temporal lobe that is called as ankur so if there is any hemorrhage due to any injury hemorrhage in this side or due to any space occupying lesion okay then it will compress this part and this medial temporal lobe that ankur it has got access to herniate transtentorial herniation because it has got the space to move downward that is called as ankle herniation now the clinical features related will be depending on how much is the amount of hemorrhage over here initially before the ankle herniation <coughs> it is suppressing this part so first and foremost there will be like loss of alertness alertness will be reduced second thing there is one term that's called as cushion triad cushion triad in this cushion triad there will be depression of the respiration depression of the cardiac center then bradycardia will be there respiratory depression will be there and hypertension that is the cushion triad so accordingly the volume of that hemorrhage it keeps on increasing the clinical features will keep on increasing and the condition of the patient will keep on deteriorating so initially there will be decrease in the alertness loss of the alertness loss of consciousness will be there cushion triad will be there now it compresses more and more then there will be the ankle herniation now what will ankle herniation do the ankush part that is like say if i try to draw this thing say this is the cerebral hemisphere both side and this is cerebellum in between this is the brain stem so this medial temporal lobe it will come downward so this brain stem at this point when it comes out it has got oculomotor now oculomotor now so when this ankus comes gets herniated it will comp compress the ipsilateral oculomotor now so initial symptom in that person who has got the hemorrhage or any space occupying lesion will be loss of ipsilateral oculomotor now now if you can recall back 
what is the function of the oculomotor now? The extra ocular muscles LR6 SO4. So LR6 means lateral lactus deviation outward, superior oblique. So oculomotor, if there is a loss of the ipsilateral oculomotor now, it means the remaining two, the fourth as well as the sixth cranial nerve, their function will get exaggerated. So sixth cranial nerve's action is to move outward to move this eye outward and superior oblique will be down so initially when the oculomotor ipsilateral oculomotor now gets compressed the eye of the affected side will be down and out like say this way it will be if i this is the eye it will be down and outward this side deviated Further increase in the uncle herniation, entire of the brain stem is getting affected. Then there will be midline because all of the nerve spline will get affected. The position of the eye will be midline and fixed pupil. In the middle, fixed pupil won't react to any response. Okay, the vestibular ocular reflex will be absent, won't react to the light, all these things. That is the clinical feature related to the eye. So we can guess or we can like say how much damage has been done by this cerebral hemorrhage. Initially due to the cerebral hemorrhage, collection of the fluids, there will be compression of the brain that will cause and there will be the edema of the brain. So all these features will keep on deteriorating. That is regarding the eye part. Now, when the brain stem is involved, then depending on which part of the brain stem is involved, we can guess by looking at the features. So in this diagram, let me first explain this diagram. This one, this part above this B line, I have taken this diagram from the Geno. You can check the Geno book. This flow chart is given. So this is the cerebral cortex, like above this dashed B line, this is the entire cerebral cortex. Okay, and this one, middle, middle one, this is the brainstem part. Okay, brainstem part. And this side is cerebellum. Now, we have talked about the extrapyramidal system, vestibulospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, and rubrospinal tract, right? So these are reticulospinal tract. This one is rubrospinal tract. This one. This one is rubrospinal tract. And this one is vestibulospinal tract. One by one, we will cover all these things. In the reticulospinal tract, there are two types, if you can recall back. One is medial reticulospinal tract. The second one was lateral reticulospinal tract. And medial reticulospinal tract it is formed by the neurons present in the pons and these are excited reticular formation right i said they are they have got their own rhythm they have got their own rhythm they keep on stimulating okay but in the case of the lateral reticular spinal tract it originates from the medial medulla and these are the inhibited reticular formation but they don't have their own autorhythmicity. They have got the control from the cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex neurons from the cerebral cortex will come and stimulate them. And only after stimulation from the cerebral cortex, they will get excited. And because they are inhibited, they will inhibit the next neuron, right? That is regarding the reticular formation. I said this excitatory reticular formation in the pons or the medial reticulospinal tract they are self-stimulating. They have got their own stimulation. Okay. Why or what, how it is present means why they are self-stimulating or what is the reason which is causing them self-stimulation? Because they have got ascending tracks via the anterior lateral system. Ascending tracks, sensory information is coming and they are stimulating these neurons. So if we cut this part, the cerebral cortex, even then they will keep on stimulating, right? 
that is regarding the reticulospinal tract. Now coming to the rubrospinal tract. Rubrospinal tract starts from the red nucleus. Red nucleus is present within the midbrain. So this entire part is brain stem, the midbrain part. Okay, midbrain part. And they have got this rubrospinal tract has got control from the cerebral cortex as well as it has got control from the cerebellum. So this tract is called as cerebellum rubral tract and this one is called as cerebrorubral tract this is cerebro coming from cerebral cerebral cortex and this is cerebellum and both of them are excited to the red nucleus and if you can recall back red nucleus it's not very much developed within the human being it's very less developed and it extends only up to the upper C3 or C4 cervical level, upper thorax of the human being. And it is excitatory to the alpha motor neuron of the flexor muscles. Right? So this red rubrospinal tract, this is rubrospinal tract. Rubrospinal tract is stimulatory to flexor alpha motor neuron. And it has got control from the cerebral cortex and from the cerebellum. Now coming to the third one, that is the vestibulospinal tract. Now this vestibulospinal tract, it has got connection with extensor alpha motor neuron. It is stimulatory to the extensor alpha motor neuron to maintain the posture, maintain the equilibrium, right? Now, if you look at the cerebellum, if you can recall back, what is the output from the cerebellum? Only the Purkinje cell and they are the inhibitory. They are inhibited to deep cerebellar nuclei. So Purkinje cell acts on the red nucleus via the interposed and this lateral nucleus, interposed and lateral nucleus or the dentate nucleus we can say. And it has got connection with the vestibular nuclei, either the directly inhibitory one or they are inhibiting the fastigial nucleus. And we all know whether this is the fastigial nucleus or the interposed or the dentate nucleus, they have got the excited teeth that we have covered in the cerebellum. So vestibulospinal tract has got stimulatory or excitatory effect on extensor alpha motor neuron. This is the extensor muscle and this one is the flexor muscle. And this reticular formation, medial reticulospinal tract, lateral reticulospinal tract, they have got effect excitatory as well as inhibitory on extensor gamma motor neuron. Gamma motor neuron will end on the muscle spindle inside and alpha motor neuron ends on extrafusal. That's why it has been shown as at ending at the extrafusal fiber. Okay. Now, the question arises. We started this topic with the bleeding or hemorrhage within the cranial cavity. And that hemorrhage compresses the cerebral cortex. And because of the compression, ultimately it will cause the herniation of the medial temporal lobe because it has got the space to come downward. Okay, it will herniate and it will keep on swelling, keep on compressing. So the we can say the brain stem will keep on getting affected from upper to lower one. If there is effect up to this level, this is called as we will assume it as midbrain level, the upper part of the midbrain. Okay, upper part of the midbrain. Then what will be the effect? What will be the clinical feature of the person who is getting affected by the compression up to the upper part, above the upper part of the midbrain? We can say if this part has been cut or this part has got affected, it means the cortical from the cerebral cortex. The cortical connection with the rest of the motor system has been removed. Okay, with the rest of the system has been removed. So if the effect of the cortic cortex is removed from the reticular formation, what will be the effect? There won't be any stimulation. If we do this D section, there won't be any stimulation of the inhibited reticular formation. So, this inhibition will be lost. 
there won't be any excitation from the cerebral cortex to this one but it has got its own rhythm through the ascending track there will be stimulation so the extensor gamma motor neuron will get more and more stimulated as compared to a normal pulse one so if more stimulation of the gamma motor neuron which is supplying the extensor muscle what will happen to the person's posture the extensor muscles extensor muscle of the arm extensor muscle of the back as well as the extensor muscle of the legs it will be hypertonic or we can say it will get rigid rigidity will be there extensor rigidity so if a person who is suffering from this level damage will have extensor rigidity of all the so that appearance of the person will be like this way like the neck extensor arm extensor back extensor as well as leg extensor that kind of rigidity is called as decorticate rigidity d corticate means we have removed the cortex part cortex part this is regarding the reticular formation now, now we talked about this reticular formation now coming to this ruprospinal tract if we do this cut section like cerebral cortex the fiber that is coming from the cerebral cortex it has been removed then this cerebrorubral tract which is stimulating this part red nucleus will be removed right but still red nucleus is intact and it is getting stimulatory effect from these cerebellar nuclei this tract corticospinal tract will be cut right and this tract corticorubral tract will be cut but the red nucleus is still receiving this cerebellorubral tract which is stimulatory so it will stimulate the flexor alpha motor neuron flexor alpha motor neuron so flexor alpha motor neuron of the upper limb so there will be flexion there is extension of the limb this sorry extension of the neck extension of the back extension of the lower limb but this red nucleus is still intact and it is stimulating the flexor alpha motor neuron so there will be flexion of the upper limb so the decorticate rigidity will not be like this but if we look at this thing cortic this one reticulospinal tract it will make all the extensor muscles of the upper lower limb back neck like this way but this effect is still present red nucleus which has got stimulatory effect on the upper limb flexor so there will be like this way flexion and extension of the neck extension of the back extension of the leg right okay so that is called as decorticate rigidity if i try to draw the diagram like say this is the neck this is the trunk and say this is the upper limb i'm sorry for being very bad at the drawing so this upper limb is got flexed neck is extended back is extended and these lower limbs they are also extended right like this way this is called as decorticate rigidity now if that compression level keeps on coming downward okay keeps on coming downward it means when it affects it comes up to the level of the lower part of the midbrain or we can say upper part of the pons then the main differentiating feature from this d section if we consider this a is this red nucleus the connection of the red nucleus to the flexor alpha motor neuron it will also get cut if it gets cut then flexor alpha motor neuron won't get stimulated and these flexor alpha motor neuron of the upper limb flexor it will be removed so that flexion will be removed and entire extension will be there 
entire extension extension of the neck extension of the back extension of the upper limb as well as extension of the lower limb that posture will be like this way now why there is extension happening of the extensor as well as the flexor muscle to prove this thing like whether it is happening due to the alpha motor neuron or the gamma motor neuron if we do the cut section see just focus at this point this is the extensor muscle right extensor muscle and this is the ascending track right and ascending tr track means this is the sensory fiber and this is This is alpha motor neuron coming to the extensor muscle. If we cut this dorsal root fiber, which is carrying the sensation, then what should happen? Forget about everything. If we stimulate this extensor muscle, if we like say, just imagine this extensor muscle is quadriceps muscle. We hit it, hit the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle, with the knee jerk, then it will stretch and that sensation is carried via the dorsal root ganglia and then alpha motor neuron is ultimately making this muscle to contract, right? So if we cut this thing, then alpha motor neuron won't get stimulated, there should be contraction, right? But if the person who is suffering from decorticate rigidity and then we do the cut section these experiments has been done then if it this extensor muscle was getting contracted just because of the alpha motor neuron then that rigidity of the extensor muscle should have got reduced did you get the point see this cortex cerebral cortex has been removed this cut section has been done and the person just focus on the extensor muscle. The person's extensor muscle is contracted very much. Right? So that contraction of the extensor muscle can happen either due to the alpha motor contraction, increased alpha motor activity, or due to the increased gamma motor activity. Now we are not sure whether it is due to the increased alpha motor activity or increased gamma motor activity. Then what we did, we did this experiment of cutting the dorsal root. If we remove Cut the dorsal root, it means the alpha motor neuron activity has been removed. But even after cutting this part, this dorsal root, that person's extensor muscle still remains contracted. What does it mean? It means this decorticate rigidity is acting via gamma motor neuron. Gamma motor neuron means if we even if we remove this apply to the extensor alpha motor neuron from the dorsal root ganglia still there is contraction of the extensor muscle it means the extensor muscles gamma motor neuron is getting more and more excited and when the gamma motor is getting more and more excited it will stretch more and more muscle spindle and because of the stretching then alpha motor will ultimately also make the muscle contract so that is the significance of doing this B cut section. Now, now coming to vestibulospinal tract. If we remove the cerebellum, if we remove the cerebellum, it means we have removed the inhibitory effect from the cerebellum to the vestibular nucleus, like cerebellovestibular tract. Then what should happen? That person who is having decorticate rigidity. In that person, if we remove this cerebellar connection to the vestibular nucleus, then what we observed, we observed that extensor rigidity was exaggerated, more exaggerated. It means more pronounced. It means we have removed the inhibitory effect from over the vestibular nucleus. So vestibular nucleus will stimulate more and more extensor alpha motor neuron. From this side, extensor gamma motor neuron are already getting stimulated. This is called as D cerebellate rigidity. So D cerebellate rigidity is nothing 
बट एक्जेटेड डी कोटिकेट रिजिडिटी एक्जेटेड डी कोटिकेट रिजिडिटी मीन्स इफ अ पर्सन हु इज सफरिंग फ्रॉम दिस डी कोटिकेट रिजिडिटी दिस सेरिबल एक्शन इज ऑल्सो रिमूव देन इट विल मोर प्रोनाउंसड ओके सो दैट इज हाउ दिस डिफरेंट डिफरेंट लेवल ऑफ द ब्रेन स्टेम और द सेबल कॉटेक्स और द इंटरकैप्सुल इट हैज गोट कनेक्टेड विद ईच अदर वी कैन बाई जस्ट ऑब्जर्विंग द पेशेंट वी कैन कम टू द कंक्लूजन लाइक विच पार्ट ऑफ द ब्रेन इज अफेक्टेड इन दैट पर्टिकुलर पर्सन जस्ट बाई लुकिंग एट द पोस्चर ऑफ दैट पर्टिकुलर पर्सन विच देर इज एक्सटेंशन पोस्चर और द फ्लेक्सर पोस्चर और ऑल्सो लुकिंग एट द पोजिशन ऑफ द आई वॉल also looking at the other clinical features like cushion triad there will be bradycardia there will be respiratory depression then there will be the hypertension so depending on we can say that this is the level of the lesion that's why they always say like a neuro a good neurologist or a good neurosurgeon is the one who will need minimum investigation just by looking at the patient that doctor can come to the conclusion to the diagnosis up to 90% chances then you go for the further investigation and confirm your diagnosis okay that's regarding this entire decorticate and decerebrate as well as the decerebellate rigid whatever we have discussed till now you might be confused like with all those connection and all so i have tried to explain it by simplified version i have removed the extra part just simplified version to make you understand the decerebrate and decorticate posture one is flexor part other one is extensor part flexor part that true of the upper limb is getting affected from the red nucleus via rubro spinal tract and that is stimulatory and the extensor of the entire the upper limb as well as the lower limb back and neck through the vestibular nucleus we have cut that reticular spinal tract to remove that confusion because the vestibular nucleus is the one which has got no control or minimal control from the cerebral cortex red nucleus and reticular spinal tract those reticular formation whether the medullary medial or the lateral all of them they have got cerebral cortex connection the vestibular nucleus has got the minimal effect okay so the vestibular nucleus is stimulatory for the extensor muscles red nucleus is stimulatory for the flexor of the upper limb if there is a lesion at the level below the red nucleus below the red nucleus then what will happen below the red nucleus is there then this rubro spinal tract will be cut so there won't be any stimulation of the upper limb flexor only and only extensor muscle they will get a stimulation so there will be decerebrate posture in decerebrate posture entire extension okay now instead of this lower level the lesion is that removal of the control of cerebral cortex on the red nucleus then it won't stimulate the red nucleus but the neuron from the red nucleus to the upper limb flexor they are intact they might get stimulated from the some other connections too so it will be more predominant for the upper limb flexor now the vestibular nucleus is acting on the rest of the body's extensor this red nucleus connection of the red nucleus to the upper limb flexor is still intact so there will be upper limb flexor this is called as decorticate posture so deterioration of a person will like who is getting suffer, suffered from the head trauma or any sort of the injury that is compressing the brain and from the compression of the brain the uncle herniation is happening and that compression is coming down and down towards the spinal cord then the first of all there will be decrease in the alertness then there will be the cushion triad it's not a sequence but all these symptoms will be there intermingled with each other by and large we can say starting with the low decrease in the alertness decrease in the consciousness then cushing triad will also be there then if less part of the, the that medial 
temporal lobe or uncle herniation is happened, then ipsilateral oculomotor nerve is getting affected, then down and out ipsilateral eye will be there, but still the <coughs> it will the other side eye will be normal. Further deterioration, both side bilateral that eye will come in the mid position and it will be fixed pupil, fixed and dilated pupil, one check to the light. Then depending on the posturing we can say there will be flexor posture of the upper limb, this one and the extensive portion of the rest of the body. When that lesion comes further downward then there will be decerebrate posture. So decerebrate posture is like the final one after that there is chances of like very very minimal survival that person is okay because when the lesion that compression is moving downward along the brain stem ultimately it will affect the medulla and when the medulla gets affected the respiratory center as well as the cardiovascular center both are present in the medulla so ultimately respiration will stop and the heart beating will also stop so that